This is Rebecca Clark, episode 143, Thwarting the Enforcers, with Harry Pellis. This podcast is for anyone that knows they haven't yet found and offered up their best work, but are compelled to seek it out and do it. Are you ready to move your desk? Who do you consider yourself to be right now? Professionally, I am a Marine Border Patrol agent. I drive a boat for Customs and Border Protection. And I've been doing that, well, driving a boat for 14 years. Um, I've been an agent for 19 years. I'm straight out of college. I'm a dad of two and uh, active member of our church and living the dream, as we like to say at work. Right. Of course, when we say that at work, sometimes that's more sarcastic than true. <laughs> It's, uh, it's very sarcastic in our job. Um, okay. It's a tough time to be doing what we're doing. Um, nobody likes us, including our you know, upper, upper, upper management uh, above and beyond our, our agency. And uh, most citizens don't care for our job. And we get called a lot of ugly things. And so it's, it's tough. So there's extreme sarcasm when we say it. Like it's tough when the, the leadership and the workers have a disconnect. I think, right? Because the, you're doing the legwork for leadership, right? So right. how do you? Right. What happens is during like the administration that we currently have, there's an extreme disconnect because the upper management, the head of Department of Homeland Security, the head of Customs and Border Protection, even our own chief, they're all political appointees and they disagree personally with the job that we do. Um, they're very much open border advocates and ignore the rule of law. And well, we're law enforcement officers. And so when management chooses to ignore the law, it puts us in an extremely difficult position. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was going to say for most of us on a job, like if we have difficulties with leadership, I mean, we can use that as something to try to work through, or we use that as a question when we're looking for another job, right? We're like, what's your leadership like? I want to make sure that I'm on board leadership. But when you're in some of these positions that you do the job regardless of which political party you're in. I would assume that takes a lot of work, mental work to shift with each kind of direction. It does. So, you know, you, you have happy years where everything's good and the job's great and we're getting support from, from on high. And then it shifts into the extreme other direction and zero support, you know, get budget slashed. We have to make do with, with broken equipment and in, extreme, extreme situations like we currently have, we have to deal with like what's going on on the Southern border with not only no support from, from headquarters, but a whole bunch of lies about what's happening there and then dealing with, you know, the media position on what they think is happening. And then just the illegalities of everything that's occurring, you know, when laws are not just ignored, but openly broken and your management's the one that's ordering you to do it. You know, morale kind of goes in the tank. In any company where, where something like that would happen, you would hemorrhage employees is what's occurring for us. Mm-hmm. So on top of added workload, we're hemorrhaging employees, which means more workload. Right. Let's do more with less. And oh, wait, all of our best and brightest are all leaving. In that scenario, like what can you actually talk about with each other? Right. Because it, it seems like even you talking with me right now, it seems like it would be difficult to know what to share and what not to share about difficulties at work because there's all these pressures from every angle. I think everybody has those, but especially if you have your kind of work, you want to do the right thing, but you also know that you are taking orders and you're working within certain boundaries and don't want to break those boundaries, or maybe you do, I don't know, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah, Uh, well, it just, it puts everybody in a really difficult situation, because you're given an illegal order, even though it's against the law, considered a lawful order by management, so you have to, you have to go through with it, you have to do what they say, even though you know, fundamentally, that it's against the law, and you can report it, and it's reported repeatedly, um, and constantly, 
But when upper management is pulling all of the strings and when the administration just doesn't care, nothing happens because there has to be a will to change from somewhere else because we can't do it. Right. As, as boots on the ground, we, we can't do it. We just have to do what we're told. So you get to make that decision in your mind as to whether this is what you are willing to do because you have some kind of purpose with it or because you see it as your only option or you think it'll change or is it something that makes you think, oh, I, I go elsewhere. Like, it seems like there's all these decisions you make as you stay there and are. do it. Right. There, there are tons. I mean, some of it, because there's ups and downs, right? Because we're in a, a, in a two-party political system. So every time there's an election, there's a chance for the pendulum to swing. Right. And so some of the things you just deal with. It's on a, a four or eight year cycle and you just kind of deal with it. Some of the things become real issues for a short term when you have a new administration, but then they lose interest and everything goes back to normal. So it's not that big of a deal and you just kind of deal with it short term. Mm -hmm. um, in this situation, well, a lot of us have chosen just to, to walk away. Anybody and everybody that's eligible for retirement has. But then you, you run into positions like, like me. There's people with a certain amount of time in where there's no point in leaving. We're too close to retirement. Mm -hmm. So you just kind of have to struggle through it. Or um, there's people without the right skill set to go to a lot of places. There's a dirty little secret about the federal government that nobody wants to talk about is that it is very, very easy to get stuck in a job because your boss can go talk to a boss across town and say, don't hire any of my people when they apply. Right. And so even if you do look to leave, you never even get a second look because they see your current employer and it gets circular filed. And um, that is currently happening. It's been happening for about four years now where we know for a fact that, that it has happened because we've had some whistleblowers talk about it. But when the upper managers make those gentlemen's agreements or gentlewomen's or whoever's in charge, then mm -hmm. you're, you're just, you're stuck, right? You like your career fields. Uh, most of us enjoy being in law enforcement and federal law enforcement specifically. Mm -hmm. And so when you look for another, another agency to work for and your boss has told them, don't hire my guys, you don't get hired. You don't get considered. And then you, know, you just get stuck little frustrated and there you are. You try to write it out as best you can. You know, it's really interesting. You're causing me to remember that years ago, I, I worked in some schools and I went to corporations and in the corporations, I was in human resources and I was in a couple of big corporations in recruiting and they were really, really strict to the point where I remember there was someone in our H department our department one day who accidentally shared the name of someone on a background investigation, which is completely normal to have a ton of background investigations going on, right? You're hiring a lot of employees. So they had to fill out the forms. I used to do this too. I'd fill out forms and send it away to the background investigation company. They'd send us back the report and we decide whether it's okay or not. And someone said the name of one of them out loud, and you're supposed to be very confidential. And they had to literally go back to their desk, pick up their box and walk out of the building. Like they were done, right? Because confidentiality was so important. Right. Then I came to the federal government. So interesting because I was a contractor at first. And I remember being in hallways and walking along and hearing people say this and then having this experience with people on our team where people go, oh, I heard you were, you applied to this job in this agency and the person would be shocked. They're like, what? Like, yeah, so-and-so called to, and said you applied. And so when we just said, oh, we don't want to let you go or something like that. And those of us who are contractors were shocked because in our private corporations that we worked for, this would never be allowed, right? You were never supposed to even if you knew someone applied for something, you should never mention it. Like that is secretive. Like you wouldn't want to mess with anything. And yet it's a very regular occurrence in the federal government. And I don't know that a lot of people know that, that it's not a secret. If you put your name out there, it some reason they talk very openly and it hurts people. It does. 
uh, I mean, the reality is it's just one giant corporation, right? Right. It's just different branches of the same giant corporation. So certain rules of etiquette and protocol don't exist because you're all fighting for the same employees. Mm -hmm. Everybody that has specific skill sets, um, they could work in any number of places. And it's just whatever the focus is currently. Yeah. You know, where do we want them to end up or, or where would we like them to be? Because all of these big bosses, they, you know, they lunch together and they know each other and right. they all know where the priority is and, and they can make those decisions. So nobody cares because it, in, it's really just one big company. What I think is interesting is that your chosen career field. Uh, so in general, people that go into these kinds of fields and work tend to how should I say it, tend to have a strong will of some sort, right? <laughs> a lot of courage, so. a lot of strength, a lot of these things. And yet you're, you're operating within a system where you have to temper that a bit, I guess, to operate in that system. And so do you have any outlets? Uh, do you have any other interest or anything that you like keep interested in, even as you still enjoy this, despite all of the things going on? I do. Um, I have a number of hobbies. My wife would, would tell you that I have too many because none of them are cheap. Like sports wise, I enjoy triathlons and scuba diving. And so I've got a, you know, a physical outlet where, you know, just obviously working out is a way to blow off steam. Right. Right. So I have that. And I have a number of, of gaming hobbies. I build and paint metal and plastic miniatures oh. uh, for war gaming. So that's a, a creative outlet that's uh, I can just forget about what I'm doing. I can go down and, and pick up a kit or, or work on a model and uh, however long it takes. And I'm just, you know, lost in that and forget that uh, how bad yesterday sucked at work. <laughs> is that like a Lego kit kind of concept or is this something you paint and then sell? Or how no, does that? I, um, I mean, you could sell them. Some people do it as a job. No, um, they're... The metal miniatures are typically one part castings. Um, okay. Plastic ones can be multi parts. Uh, it's kind of a, a guy's world. There's not a lot of women in it. So you've probably never seen it. You probably never built a model kit when you were a kid, like a, a plastic airplane or car or ship or, or any of those type of models. No, they um, frustrated me. <laughs> <laughs> they frustrate a lot of people. Um, so it's, it's similar to that in that uh, the, the base materials can be metal or resin or plastic or even wood. And then just depending on what the model might be, build it and paint it, right. decorate it, whatever. Um, the end result typically is to, is to create some sort of, of army or force of a collection of, of models that you would use to play a game. Uh, miniatures wargaming is, encompasses everything from, from historicals to science fiction to fantasy. Um, anything you can think of, there's probably a game designed right. for it with, with miniatures and, and building kits to support it. I think one of my brothers was always into not building those, but setting up little wars and things around. He probably would have been into that a little bit more if he had known about it. That's yeah. Him. Yeah. We have a bit of a, uh, the, the hobby has a little bit of a, a promotion problem because most people don't know about it uh, with social media. It, it's uh, more and more people do know. Um, then all you find, you, you know, you find out crazy things like Henry Cavill plays Warhammer and all hmm. these people are like, well, I play Warhammer. Then everybody else is like, well, what is Warhammer? Well, Superman plays it. So it must be okay. Right. Uh, so it, it's kind of a golden age, lots of support from, from companies that produce the products and a lot of, uh, of social media exposure, and then more and more people play it. There's a greater availability of it. That's my creative outlet. Gives me something to do. Keeps me focused when work isn't doing it. And right. Yeah. Well, you mentioned retirement. Like you felt like you had to stay until you retire. Like you're not that old. So no. is retirement pretty early from that career. It is. Okay. Um, all law enforcement has pretty early retirement ages because you just. You can't physically do the job once you get past a certain age. You know, nobody wants a 70 year old partner in the field. Right. When things go sideways. Um, in federal law enforcement, mandatory retirement age is for most of the jobs is 57. So 
you know, we have maximum hiring ages, right? Just mm-hmm. you cannot be hired, you know, once you're you hit your 37th birthday. So I'm uh, 19 years and change in, and I can retire with, with 20 years once I'm 50. So I'm a little, just over two years away from retirement or okay. my, my first retirement points. And wow. So are you thinking about what you would want to do next? Or are uh, you yeah. waiting? Well, no, I mean, you got to have a plan, right? So you can't mm-hmm. really just all of a sudden retire and, and not have a plan because we see it too often. So you get the guys that are super focused on work, they retire, they have nothing. And within two years, they're generally gone. They're the generally of, gone, like dead, like dead, pass away. Right. The, the sheer number of coworkers I've had that that's happened to is just, it's astounding within six months to two years of retirement, they're, they're dead. You're like, well, what's the point of working for 25 or 35 years to, to enjoy retirement for six months or a year? That seems kind of pointless. And generally, those guys that it happens to, they're ones with zero hobbies, no interests. And um, once work's gone, they've got nothing. Sit at home and just waste away. My ideal plan is to do absolutely nothing once I retire, except what I want. You know, go fishing, mm-hmm. build models, enjoy life. So we'll see how that works out. Toyed with with possibly um, teaching at the university level once I uh, retire. Mm-hmm. Um, but that would mean another degree. And I'm not super keen on going back to school. Depends on what school you teach at. Well, that's true. But if I, and, and that's, you know, where part of the plan comes in. It's like, well, what would I want to teach? Because I had a non-traditional entry into law enforcement and work in sort of a non-traditional law enforcement field, I don't have some of the same background that say like a local police officer or sheriff's deputy has. Mm -hmm. Um, So teaching at community college where those classes are are taught, I never took criminal justice. I don't have a degree in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. Um, So teaching at uh, a normal police academy is out for me because I don't have the credentials for it. So I would need something else if, you know, if I wanted to, to, to teach kind of, it's, it's always there. Think about it, look into, to, to classes and, and online learning and all that and, and think about it. And right. it's still kind of on the back burner, uh, just a possibility, uh, maybe. Well, um, you know what, it's interesting. You brought up no other work that I've ever been in have people actively tried to stay until they were to retire and died younger than those that have been in the federal government jobs that I've been in. Like it, it's happened so much that, I mean, it, we would bring it up in meetings. I worked with people where I was far below the average aged for the last 15. I, I worked for government about 15, 16 years. And I was always lower than the average because we had a training and development organization and we'd break, people were retired from air force, Navy, Marines, and they would come and be sure. professors, you know, and instructors for the courses. And so it was interesting talking to some people they are like, Oh, I can't retire. Then I'll die. You know, like <laughs> it was a known thing that like, if I retire, I will die. And I'm like, where, where did that idea come from? Right. But it would happen. And you start to realize, Oh, because at least in my setting, this was their life right? There's some people that lived every day at the Pentagon for 25 years. Right. And that's all they knew. And if you've ever been in the Pentagon, you know, there's banks, there's cafeterias, there's stores, you know, there's, it's like a little town in there. Right. And they were there before the sun came up and there after the sun went down, that was their whole way of being. And when they had to be with themselves, they couldn't do it. And so a lot of people came back as contractors or something. So it's interesting to hear that that was not just a local thing, that that's, that pervades in an organization like that. And like, oh, that's, I wonder if it's related, right? That feeling like, oh, if I stay, I'll be taken care of forever. But, oh, if I stay, I also might not live beyond my service. So it's a very, from a mindset perspective and what that does to your thinking it, it would be interesting if someone studied that or something, because I'm not going to study it, but I know that people I've talked to, I've noticed a pattern with some of that. And I would literally have some conversations in the hallway, even with the janitor. And I'd say, how are you doing today there? And they would literally say, well, 
10 years, five months, two weeks, two days, three hours, and then I'm free. And I'm like, how do you know that the date and time? <laughs> and so it, it, it's fascinating to me because I'm one of the people that decided to give up the benefits and it's been at great cost, but I also have felt there's something else I'm supposed to be doing that I couldn't do there. Right. And so, right. so I've knowingly, you know, left something where I kind of climbed to the top of it, where many people may have wished they were the level I was at, but I got there, learned a heck of a lot and then realized, uh, is this burnout going to kill me in my forties or fifties? <laughs> 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 so it's, it's interesting to hear. I hope for every person that is like you, there's also other people doing the same thing that are at the point in the journey where they're like, oh, I am going to go teach. Right? right. And they find a way to teach. And even if they're not selected an organization, they figure out something interesting to do. And so it'll be interesting to see what you choose on this journey that you're on. Uh, have you heard of the guy? Uh, I'm going to say it wrong. Jaco or Jacko or Jocko, or he's a former military guy. He has quite the social media presence. He kind of talks about habits and, you know, going mm. after your dreams or whatever. I think it's very interesting to see some of these people, um, doing what they might've felt the way you currently feel perhaps, right. That, Oh, I'm not sure where my skills transfer to, but they kind of created something themselves to right. make themselves valuable, regardless of what system decided they were valuable or not. So it's an interesting thing to think about from my perspective. Anyway, I don't know if it's interesting from your perspective. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, because so many people end up with a weird skill set. And the whole world wants to say, well, that doesn't have any value past what you just right. finished doing. Um, so, you know, twisting it and turning it into something that's valuable and you know, making a, a living off of it is, is always an interesting thing. I spent seven years in the Utah Guard. And so I have a lot of military friends too. And, you know, let's face it, you come out of the military, if, uh, if you were an infantryman, you have one very good skill set. You know how to kill people and blow things up. And that doesn't translate you know, straight across to any other position in the civilian world, um, right. unless you go to Blackwater, which a lot of them do, right? Because it's just mm -hmm. a straight transition and it's very easy. But the reality is, is they learn a whole bunch of, of other skills that are just um, their subsurface skills and abilities and that transition to very well to other things, right? which makes them extremely valuable employees in, in many situations just because of the other skills and abilities they have above and beyond what you would call, you know, their their toolkit or their, their profession. You know, I, I feel like I've got to just talk to this author. Cause I keep sharing this book with people. I'm going to put it right here so you can see it range. Mm -hmm. Why generalists specialize or no, why generalists triumph in a specialized world. And he shares examples, you know, from corporations, from military, from schools, all that. And just to show that sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to be this when I grow up. And some people actually do that thing, right? right. Like I'm going to be an accountant. And then they march forward and they do 40 years of accounting and they retire and all that stuff. But most people don't fit that, especially nowadays. And his book points out, uh, they studied all these different people and everything and realized that sometimes like, all of your crazy different experiences that don't seem like they match up actually make you the perfect person to solve or create something in the future, right? So they're saying a pharmaceutical company that puts out a website asking for ideas on how to solve problems its chemists can't solve, and then a lawyer comes in with an idea, right? Someone from a completely different profession or one of them where there's this oil spill challenge and a guy had an idea because he bought a Slurpee. And as he was slurping the stuff and, and watching how the, the stuff came up, the straw and everything, he had an idea of like, mm -hmm. wait a second, what if this was applied to the oil spill? And I don't remember the way it was applied, <laughs> but it was just example after example where you had the 
person coming from art that solved the math problem or the person that came from like law enforcement solving this little challenge over here, you know, and right. to see how it all can come together in an interesting way that only you could provide the world. And it, it's, I've listened to this book three times when I was mowing the lawn because I was so inspired because I guess it made me feel like, oh, all of our experiences are worth it even if they were a fluke, right? Like that they all right. comes together toward whatever you offer. So it'll be interesting to see what you do. Do you have any regrets on the career choice you chose? I know you came up, you stumbled across it. If I remember correctly, like I, I college did. recruiter or something. Yep. It was a, a straight stumble. Um, I was uh, a international studies major at BYU and was looking to um, go into the foreign service. And I really loved my time in South America and was looking forward to going back um, in foreign service, working at uh, embassies in, you know, just in foreign development and foreign aid and just interaction, interacting with foreigners and foreign countries and doing what I could in Latin America. because I, I enjoyed my time there. I thought it would be a lot of fun. And of course, 9-11 happens and uh, just changed a lot of global priorities and personal priorities for a lot of people. In me, it was, I'm not taking my family overseas. We're easy targets in other countries, and um, the threat has been magnified greatly. I'm not going to raise a young family in a, in a foreign place where they have to live in a, in a fortified compound and, and drive in an armored car to school and interact with very, very few people. Because what kind of life is that? You know, kind of reined in my job search and, and started looking into um, just various branches of the, the government. I was looking for an FBI recruiter actually the, at the um, the job fair. So this this recruiter just didn't seem interested at all. Kind of shoved a, a pamphlet across. He's like, you can sign up online for the um, the initial test, and you know, test is coming up whenever. Give me a date, and went back to what he was doing. Never made eye contact. Never really talked to me. I was like, geez, wow. <laughs> this guy is awesome at his job. Not. Nah. Like, wow. But the FBI recruiter was not there. The CIA recruiter was not there. The NSA recruiter was very, very specific in what they were looking for and was very loud about it. She was kind of an angry lady and um, because people kept talking to her and she's like, we're just looking for Persian Farsi speakers, native Arabic speakers, uh, linguists and um, forensic accountants. All the rest of you, I'm not interested. And, but what about, it's like, no. And she's kind of shouting and it's like, well, don't have any of those degrees. So right. the whole thing was kind of a bust, except I have this one test that I can take and see if I'm moving forward. I had already taken the foreign service test and was just waiting on that for the results to come back. And I was like, well, it's a test. I can tell my wife, I tried, I'll take this test and see what happens. Because I mean, you know what happens immediately after 9-11. Um, the entire economy tanked. Everybody I was in school with that was planning to go to that was planning to graduate and had jobs lined up already in the civilian world. All of those jobs were those job offers were rescinded. All oh. of those companies had started to shrink already by you know early uh, 2002, and so most of them were scrambling for grad school openings. They're like, there's no jobs. I might as well stay in school while I have zero job opportunities and then increase wow. my, my saleability. It was kind of a struggle. And so I was like, well, I'll take this test. We'll see what happens. If nothing else, it's a job until I find the next job. Then it ended up being that my oral boards for foreign service and my first day in the border patrol were on the same day. So I had to make a choice. Mm. It was an oral board to possibly get a job sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. that I wasn't super keen on getting anyways because of the, literally the foreign service taking my family overseas or a definite job, you know, today that I start and, and start getting paid. So I went, I went with the border patrol. I headed off to the academy and, uh, and graduated and started in a career. And here we are 19 years later, still doing it. It's incredible. It's like these little moments that create this trajectory in a different right. direction. What would you tell to your children that are heading out into the world now what are some things you would tell them to be aware of as you go search for the right kind of work or career for them don't be a border patrol agent <laughs> <laughs> don't do what i did 
as much fun as I've had and as good as it's been, it feels like we're, we're circling the drain. The agency isn't what it used to be. And it's just, it's been successive administrations that have gutted upper managements and put, well, I'll call them lackeys because that's what they are. It's yes, men and women who, who will do what they're told regardless of whether or not it's right and regardless of whether or not it's legal and constitutional. And I professional opinion, it's, uh, it's endemic at the upper levels of the entire federal government. What's lawful and constitutional or irrelevant, what mm-hmm. feels good matters. Let's say the right words to keep the, the populace happy and, right. uh, and we'll just keep this smoke show going where they don't really know what's going on. The media is complicit in it. So the, mm-hmm. the, the things that are illegal that are occurring never get reported in U.S. press. You can find them in foreign press from time to time. Don't work for the federal government. Sure, you know, it's a, a decent pension and, and a decent career. You're going to sell your soul at some point. Um, do something else. Go anywhere else. Well, in the future, um, may not have any pensions. And so that'll really impact people's decision making, I think. It, it, pensions were such a benefit for many. They start to look at things going, if that job did not have a pension, would I take it? And sure. Some people change their opinion in a second. <laughs> Very much so, right? Because some things just aren't worth it. Right. Um, the, the daily grind, if there's no end, you just, what's the point? Right. Well, I hope that you can turn some of these side gigs that your wife said cost a lot. Maybe you can turn them into money makers, not money <laughs> drainers or whatever they're called. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that you're standing up for yourself, uh, even though it, it hurts you temporarily and possibly in some things at work, I think it'll be to your benefit overall. Oh yeah. Um, I'm never getting promoted. That's for sure. Right. Um, and then they know they don't have that over me anymore either, because I've told them I don't care. It doesn't bother me. And, and yet some people respect that. I'm sure they do. Um, and then the ones that don't respect it, they're afraid of it. So right. either way you win. Right. <laughs> but thank you again. And uh, we'll talk soon and I'll be editing this in the next day or so. Okay. And keep you posted. So thank you. Cool. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the show today. If you enjoyed it, I'd love if you'd write a review and share the show with your friends. Sign up for a weekly nudge at moveyourdesk.com. your desk.com.